Hello everyone and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today I'm chatting with Zach Carter. He's a senior reporter at the Huffington Post, but more importantly this year he published a new book as biographer called The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. And just last week, Publishers Weekly selected this book as one of its best 10 titles of the year. Zach, welcome. Let's start with a simple question. Wasn't Cain simply wrong about the Treaty of Versailles? Man, tough question out of the gate. I, I don't think so. Uh, but of course, there, there, are, um, there are people who have made this case over the years. Um, you can talk about the Treaty of Versailles as a, in his critique of the Treaty of Versailles, as an economic critique or a political critique. I think a few years after 1922, I believe, after the treaty had been signed, uh, Keynes did a sort of follow-up analysis called a revision of the treaty, which was basically 80,000 words of I told you so. And he goes through the uh, debt and resource numbers in detail uh, and says, look, I was right. Uh, I find that persuasive. Um, there's a very uh, prominent critique from the 1940s. Uh, he, by the son of the translator for uh, Clemenceau at, at Versailles, which says Keynes is wrong about all the economic numbers. Um, but I don't find that persuasive and I don't have it in front of me so I can't get into the exact details, but I don't think so. I think if you think about the Treaty of Versailles as a political document that sets the terms for international cooperation over the, the coming decade, uh, the imposition of scarcity across not only uh, Germany, but also Britain and the, the victorious allies uh, through the refusal to wipe out debt and to impose um, de facto austerity on Germany through high reparations levies um, results in a lot of international discord. Um, people see their money going to other countries uh, and, it, and it fuels nationalism and, uh, and discontent. I think he's basically right about that. Uh, but, but do you not agree? Well, if we look at the numbers, it seems Germany never paid more than 2.5% of its GDP in a given year in terms of reparations. And that's less than what Hitler asked Germans to pay for rearmament. So if Keynes had simply made a political argument, well, this is going to irritate the Germans politically, but he made an economic argument that it's impossible. And that seems entirely feasible. There are plenty of countries back then, 2.5% poorer than Germany or more, uh, didn't Keynes, in fact, lend some credence to the notion that Germany had been stabbed in the back by the Allied powers, by Britain's most prominent intellectual endorsing the notion? And uh, he had somewhat of a political critique, but on the economics, he was wrong? Well, I mean, you, you're right that Germany never paid uh, the reparations duties that were, were due, but I think that's, that's sort of inherent in the critique. If they were unaffordable, they weren't going to pay them. And of course, by 1923, Germany is in a hyperinflation crisis. So I think the idea that Germany could afford to pay is, is, is tied up in the, the political circumstances of, of the day. Well, but again, countries poorer than Germany didn't have to hyperinflate, right? The Germans brought that upon themselves. Plenty of Eastern Europe was more than 2.5% poorer than Germany. They made various mistakes. Uh, but in terms of what it interjected into German politics, didn't Keynes misread the situation thinking that his message ultimately would be supporting German liberalism. What turned out is that Europeans ended up more at each other's throats. And again, on the economics, it just doesn't seem that convincing. No one likes to pay 2.5% of GDP. Uh, but you know, you go to the later 1920s, there's the transfer problem debate with Olin. Wasn't Keynes wrong about that as well? Uh, just just to, to stick with the with the 2.5 percent. I mean, the the task for Germany was not just paying money; it's holding together a democratic coalition. So the politics of this are, are I think, inseparable from, um, from from the economic numbers. You know, when we talk about mistakes that the German government made in the 1920s, whether it's up to hyperinflation or or even later, uh, and clearly, I mean, there <laughs> there are a lot of mistakes. I think into the late 1920s, Germany is deflating in a way that I think is. Uh, you know, wrong-headed, uh, but but particularly early on, I mean, the the German government is trying to hold together a political coalition, and if um, that coalition, it, those political realities 
uh, I think have to be taken into account. You have people who are suffering, particularly at the very early uh, days of, of the post-war treaty, um, like serious material suffering uh, throughout Germany, people literally starving to death, um, it, largely due to the Allied blockade, but, but also just because the, the war cost a lot of money and drained a lot of resources. Um, and so if you want to get people to support democracy under those circumstances, and remember Germany is in you know, literal revolt, I mean, they're executing communists uh, in, in 1919 and 1920, uh, you've got to find some some way to tell people like here here is here is a better future for you. Um, we are you do not need to turn to to authoritarianism on the right or the left. We are going to provide you with things. We are not going to raise your taxes. And each of these political parties needs to uh, you know to have to have its own sort of uh, financial base. So I, I you know could Germany have have raised more taxes and uh, and shipped more money abroad? Yeah. Probably, but but how much? You know, I, I think I think Keynes is right. This this was a, 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 a what was being asked of Germany was was too much. If we think of Bertel Olin's critique in 1929, he's actually saying Keynes is oddly non-Keynesian. So Olin is saying, if you transfer the money abroad, the German mark will weaken. This will boost German exports, and what later became known as Keynesian open economy macro models, Germany gets back a lot of what it sent abroad probably not all of it, uh, but quite a bit. Paul Samuelson thought Aline was correct. I mean, was Keynes wrong about the transfer problem in the late 20s? Oh, I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to this, uh, this, this sort of broader critique that, that Keynes is, in 1919 is, is not Keynesian. I mean, um, he's looking at this from a very, he, he's looking at these, uh, these transfers as a very uh, zero-sum game, right? Um, what, what Britain can't, you know what what Germany ships abroad it can't it, it doesn't get back i mean there there is a time problem here though even if you accept this this critique, it takes time for the money to come back to Germany. The money has to be lent back into the German economy by somebody right and and during the 1920s I, I think later on Keynes is pretty clear about this you know the United States is lending money uh, not only to germany but but to Europe, and so long as that game keeps going, the cycle of funds is is sustainable. Uh, but of course, by you know the, the late 1920s, that's no longer the, the United States stops lending money for for various reasons. But you know, right up into the into 1922, 1923. I mean, I I think when you know, when, when you have the <laughs> the the French government um, you know occupying the Rhine, um, you know, th there are political instabilities there that make the flow of funds pretty pretty difficult uh, and those political tensions are are occurring you know, they don't just spring up in 1923 they're they're there from the moment the treaty is signed early in his career why was Keynes so keen to work in the India office right he chose that well I don't know if he was so keen he really wanted to work in the treasury uh, the, the treasury department and it was sort of a disappointment to him he I think he'd come in second or, or third on his his you know, big exams at the yes. end of his time at, uh, at Cambridge. He'd, he'd wanted to be number one. He was recognized as this brilliant fellow. Um, so I, I think he wanted to be at Treasury and, and he viewed the India office as a bit of a disappointment. Um, but I think one of the things he liked about working there was the way he could, uh, he, he did seem to take to looking at the currency situation. You know, he wrote a book, his first book is called, I think, Indian Currency and Finance. It's from 1912 or 1913. And he's, it's his, sort of his first real serious analysis of the gold standard and, and the, way, the way it works um, within the British Empire. And so I think he, he finds it intellectually engaging in certain respects, but it's not quite as, it's not as prestigious as being in treasury, which is what he, he really wants. Um, and he feels a little bit guilty about that, um, that sort of sense of ambition. His, his friends in Bloomsbury think that working for the government is this embarrassing sort of uh you know political thing to do he should be pursuing you know art and aesthetics and and writing and and philosophy instead of instead of government um so i don't think he's super happy at at the india office um but it is his sort of his introduction to the british bureaucracy and i, I do think he he enjoys being part of the british bureaucracy he likes being a man of affairs who's connected to to sort of the, the great problems of the day i don't think in the india office he feels like he is attached to the grandest problems of, of the day. He feels like it's, it's, a, it's a sort of lesser than kind of post. What do you think of the substance of Keynes's work for the India office? 
it's interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, he has a, a lengthy report on, hang on, I haven't reviewed this in, in years. Um, he has a lengthy report on, on conditions after uh, a, a type of sort of recession in India, where he says, essentially, the, the British government's response has been rather lackadaisical and a lot of um, a lot of suffering has happened and you can see his superiors are like this is this is a little bit a little bit too much can you tone it down and he does um, I, I I think of it as sort of he's at this point in his life he's thinking about he's thinking about liberalism and internationalism as uh, he, he thinks of the British Empire as, as sort of this grand liberal enterprise that is bringing freedom and democracy and prosperity to the rest of the world. And I, I think he views the relationship with India as, as you know, like everybody in Britain, it's, it's you know, the essential British colony economically in terms of resources. Um, I, I don't think he ever really questions seriously what um, the substance of that relationship means based on the economic relationships that, that he's analyzing. He's looking at the India issue as a very technical and narrow issue, um, largely on, you know, how the gold standard operates and, and how, uh, <laughs> how India not, not allowing the convertibility of gold within its borders, um, you know, functions. And it's, it's, it's sort of a technocratic, it's a narrow and technocratic analysis, I think he's missing, I don't think he's focused on the, the big questions with India the way he would later be when, um, when he would be working in the Treasury during the war. You know, I think of the India office as having been good for Keynes, it made him less conformist. But if you look at his writings on Malthus, he was obsessed with Malthus at the time. Yep. He talked about competition between the races. He was interested in eugenics. He has a lot of remarks about India that show a bigger picture concern but one that's very non-egalitarian. So I view Keynes on India as decidedly anti-egalitarian. Would you agree with that? Uh, no. <laughs> but he wants I, the British to I rule them. He, I mean, he I, never I, entertains democracy for India, which was right. not that radical an idea then. No, right? I, I, agree, I agree with that. Um, and yes, yes, I, I agree with that. But I, the the idea that Keynes is, um, I mean, look throughout his career, he's talking about he views the British Empire as this sort of force of of benevolence throughout the world, and he thinks that being part of the British Empire is part is is a way for people from you know all you know, wherever they are to participate in democracy and, and prosperity, and and that is very much part of the sort of liberal imperialist conception of the time. Um, the idea that it's not egalitarian, I, that's, that's where I, you know, like, I think, I think he's confused about that. I think he's just wrong. Um, but I do think he believes the way that he thinks about, um, about joining the British empire. I think he believes that that is a, that is an egalitarian thing to do, um, which I think, you know, imperialists <laughs> across time have believed, uh, when, when they come from a sort of, um, progressive perspective. And, and of course, that's, you know, that's just often not true. And I think in the case of Britain and India, it's, it's not. But say in Indian currency and finance, Keynes shows this remarkable knowledge of numbers and statistics from India, which he had a, a phenomenal grasp on. Right. So he must have known the Indian growth rates under British rule were quite low, which has been confirmed by later research. It was one of the big problems with colonialism, not the only one. So I think my implicit mental model of Keynes, consistent with his interest in eugenics is that he thought that India on its own was just intrinsically a slow growth nation and they'd have a slow growth rate under the British, but they would do worse on their own. Do you think that's the wrong implied mental model of how Keynes viewed this? I don't, I don't know that it's wrong. Uh, I mean, I, you know, this he clearly knows that something's not quite right. Otherwise he wouldn't be studying the financial system in India um, and India's relationship with, with Britain under the gold standard uh, and the you know, particular way that India not having convertibility, I mean, it's the basic subject of Indian currency and finance. So he does think that British rule can be improved. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, broadly, I mean, he's, he's a liberal imperialist. He thinks that 
that Britain is bringing prosperity and freedom around the world. And so he thinks that if you join the British Empire, particularly at this stage of his life, um, that you are you are signing up for uh, you know to to be to be led into the light. I have at least twenty different friends who studied the general theory, Keynes's book from nineteen thirty six, <laughs> sure yes. the big famous one. And I ask them, what's the central message of the general theory? They all give me different answers. So yeah. I'd like to know what's your answer. There's so much in the book, right? Incredibly rich and multifaceted. But what's the bottom line core of the yeah. general theory? Yeah, you love the hard questions. Uh, it's I, I think the bottom line, I mean, I, I wrote in the book uh, that the, the bottom line core message of the general theory is that prosperity is not hardwired into human beings, that it has to be guided through political leadership. Uh, and I think that traces back to some extent to what, um, what you're just talking about, about India. I mean, he views the state and the government as from a very early age um, as this sort of guiding hand that, that can it's, it's, you know, in the case of India, it's, it's a bit paternalistic, um, but, but also domestically, he believes that government is sort of a necessary force um, to organizing human affairs. And I, you know, on, on the general theory, there's, <laughs> it's a complicated book, right? Uh, and, and in certain respects, it's, it's not always consistent with itself. But I think that, that there's a political message, which is that political guidance is needed for prosperity to exist, for markets to function. And I think there's also a, a reevaluation of what economics is doing and, and how economics functions. Keynes is not focused on scarcity at this point. And uh, I think Michael Kalecki um, has written about this. Um, and I, I think, he's, I think this, this idea that Keynes is refocusing the sort of nature of, of economics and economic you know, humanity from competition for scarce resources towards um, the idea that uncertainty about the future is the most important sort of psychological condition for, for economics. And if you believe in scarcity as the overriding issue, you're gonna to come to different conclusions about how the world works than if you believe uncertainty is the overriding issue. So I'm not sure which one of those is the most important, but those are the two that I think are, are, are key. And at the, le the more specific level of macroeconomics, some people will say it's wage and price stickiness. Some say it's fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. uh, some say it's the theory of liquidity preference. That's what Milton Friedman thought. Right. Uh, wh which of those uh, makes it all work? It, 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 interest rates. You know, I, look, I, I, I think chapter 12, where he talks about um, financial markets, is a really, really critical chapter for me. Um, you know, in, in that chapter, Keynes is, is saying, if we want to, we, that's, that's where the uncertainty really, really comes to, to be key. We don't know what the future brings. And so if we don't know what the future brings, the way that we think about, um, about markets as being things that correct for, uh, you know, for errors or, or, you know, or social problems really, um, is, is, is much more complicated. Um, we, if we don't know what the future's what the future is is going to bring then you know we, we may hoard money when it you know may not be good for us to hoard money um we will we will make spending choices that are different i mean i i think paul krugman has a a, a fairly famous at least among you know, liberal economists analysis of keynes where he says there, there are these chapters one through four keynesians and chapter 12 keynesians i i don't really like that that breakdown. I think I think chapter twelve is really essential to understanding the critique of Say's law, which which you get in in the first four chapters. Did Keynes have significant misgivings about technocratic governance, and should he have had more misgivings, given how <laughs> British rule over India went, given how the post-war settlement went? Those people were, by and large, technocrats. Yeah, and he you know, with a lot of these questions, it depends on um, which Keynes you ask. There's a, a great um, a, a, just a great memoir that he presents to his friends in Bloomsbury in 1938, I think, where he says, um, you know, we, when I was young, I didn't realize that civilization was this thin crust that was preserved through the skillful acts of a few, right? That's a very not egalitarian way of conceiving of, of human progress. Um, but at other times, you know, he, he seems to think that, uh, that people are capable of you know, this sort of spontaneous flowering of, of, of goodness and light um, through 
aesthetic achievements, art, art, whatever. Um, and that and that people really, I mean, to to believe in um, progress the way he does, he has to have a certain faith in the ability of ordinary people to make good decisions. He certainly thinks that good ideas will conquer bad ones. And this isn't just because the smartest, best people will be persuaded. He thinks people in general have this sort of rational rationality about them where they will come to see things that are, that are true, uh, as true. And, you know, I, I think, yeah, he probably does have too much, too much faith on the balance of his life in, in the ability of technocrats to order, uh, to order affairs to the goods. Certainly he has much, far too much faith in the ability of the British Empire to order its affairs. Although, you know, I think the experience of Versailles sort of um, jaundices that view for him a bit. He sees the British Empire in a new light after the war, largely because his friends in Bloomsbury are telling him he's, you know, this terrible, horrible sellout for participating in the war. Um, but he never totally loses that, um, that sort of sense of, or at least the, the, the desire to view the British Empire as, as this fountain of goodness and light, even, even in World War II, when he's much more influential, I think, in, as, as a policymaker, um, you know, he, he's perplexed at the Americans' desire to, to carve up the British Empire. He just sort of takes for granted that, you know, obviously we want to keep all of these different colonies and territories under British rule, that would be good for the world. Um, and he can't, he can't even really come to see that Roosevelt is, is going in that direction when it's really quite obvious, uh, at least in hindsight, uh, what, what Roosevelt is doing. So yeah, I think he, he probably does have too much faith in, in technocrats, but also you know, a lot of his legacy as a policymaker is forged by uh, technocratic policymaking at the end of the war. You know, the, the British National Health Service is still with us. That's uh, innovation of, uh, of British technocracy at the hands of the uh, Socialist Labor Party at the time. And, and Keynes was- But that's not Keynes' is doing. Well, I mean, he does, uh, he is the sort of financial architect of it. He's, he works very, very closely with getting the, getting the numbers right and having the papers to wave around to say that this is, uh, you know, this is, this, this stuff adds up. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's a decent argument to be made at the time that the numbers don't add up. But, uh, but I, I certainly think Keynes is uh, an important, an important player in that, uh, in that milieu. Do you think Keynes was in some ways too flexible a thinker? So you discuss in your book his 1933 essay on national self-sufficiency, which is quite protectionist, though usually Keynes was a strong free trader. And what's striking to me in that essay is not that he makes the Keynesian jobs argument, well, you need tariffs to protect domestic jobs, that you would mm -hmm. expect. But there is a whole section talking down the benefits of division of labor, saying, oh, these aren't so <laughs> yeah. great, we yeah. don't need it. Didn't he too many times put on the hat of a kind of advocate and played too often the role of debater? He certainly loved to play debater. I mean, he, he's, that starts very early. He, he loves being part of the Cambridge debating union, I think the liberal debating union. Um, he loves debating conservatives in particular in, the, in his early days. Um, you know, I, I think it's impossible to separate Keynes, the political activist from Keynes, the economic analyst. I, and I don't think, I don't know that he would want us to separate those things, at least at, at least from this stage in history. I mean, certainly during his lifetime, he occasionally put on the hat, like, I'm just looking at the numbers. This is just what the numbers say. Um, but, you know, he comes from a, he's a philosopher first and an economist second. And in, in, in a lot of ways, I think his economics are just this sort of dressed up kind of uh, mathematical justification for, for philosophical views that he's he's been wrestling with on a deeper level. Um, particularly when he's at Cambridge, you know, he's, he's embroiled in these debates with Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein and, and all of his friends in Bloomsbury about what constitutes a good life. And I think that social vision stays with him over the course of his lifetime. And, and the reason his economics keep changing is because he's trying to find some sort of intellectual justification for that social vision, which I, I think is really paramount in his, um, in his worldview and, and in, in his work. What should we make of the preface Keynes wrote for the German language edition of the general theory, where he basically says to the Nazis, well, my ideas will work better under your system. It's not at all that I think Keynes was pro-Nazi. Clearly he was no. not at, no. at all. <laughs> no. But is that another example <clears throat> of Keynes in a sense being too flexible, even philosophically? He's, he's aware, I mean, I think the precise language is- Like is, Hayek never did that to Pinochet. Right. 
I mean, he said, Friedman didn't. Well, I mean, what, what, what is the language? The language is something like, I'm, I'm aware that in many respects, uh, my economic system is easier to operate under an authoritarian government, something like that. Something right? like that, but yeah. in German, of course, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, look, I mean, isn't that just true, right? Like, if, if you're looking at Keynesian economics from a, from a technical perspective, I mean, he is, his, it's a theory about how the state can organize resources uh, better than uh, atomized financial markets can, right? I mean, it's the, the, the dangers of the authoritarian government at, for Keynes are not in um, the organization of, of resources, but in what they're organized for. And in his letters, his letter to Hayek about the road to serfdom, he, he discusses this in, in greater detail. I mean, he, he's clearly aware that this system can be, uh, can be abused. But if you're just thinking about how, how to you know, create economic growth, I mean, yes, certainly you, you don't have to deal with all of these inconveniences of democracy to just, to just make things happen in an authoritarian system. Um, I don't know if I read that as Keynes being, you know, sympathetic to the German government or um, advising. No, he's, he's not. Nazis he's sympathetic to, to, to his that, own yeah. ideas and wants right. to promote them. But to me, there's a discord. So Milton Friedman spends, mm -hmm. what, 45 minutes talking to Pinochet, has a very long record of insisting economic and political freedom come together, maybe even too simplistically, uh, writes against the system of apartheid in South Africa and Rhodesia, calls for free markets there, and people give Friedman hell over that. And Keynes writes a preface for the Nazis and favors eugenics his whole life, and that's hardly ever mentioned. I don't know that the way that Keynes talks about eugenics is as salient as um, you suggest. I mean, the best article that I came across on Keynes and eugenics is by this guy, I think David Singerman. Um, it's in the Journal of British Studies. It's a pretty in-depth look at, at the way Keynes came to eugenics and what he did and did not support. And it's very clear that Keynes didn't didn't support eugenics in the way that, you know, Americans sterilizing, uh, you know, poor black workers in the South were, were interested in, in eugenics. Keynes was broadly interested in it from the perspective of birth control. He comes to it thinking about, this is a time when eugenics and genetics are not as clearly defined as they are today. So he's thinking about heritability of eye colors, how he gets involved in, in this stuff. Um, and he never really supports anything other than, um, than, than birth control. And when he actually has power as a policymaker, he just doesn't do any of this stuff. He, he is working on uh, the beverage plan. He is working on you know, uh, financial stuff that, that is much more egalitarian than, um, than what we think of when we, we think about eugenics. So, um, but he is chair of the British Eugenics Society for right. eight years late in and, his career. And he, and he doesn't do much there, right? I mean, the, the, and there are big debates that are happening within that, within that society, and he's mostly sitting them out. I mean, Singerman goes into this in, in much more detail. I think Singerman thinks, it's been a while since I've read the article, but you know, I, Singerman seems to think that this is a, a useful way of understanding um, Keynes's worldview, but not that Keynes is you know, some guy who's going around wanting to sterilize people and, uh, and do the things that we think of with, uh, with the eugenics movement in the United States. Um, I, I don't think he wants to sterilize people, but he has those essays on population, which mm -hmm. are not <clears throat> put into the collected works. They're not mentioned by Roy Harrod. And he is greatly worried that the people from some countries, I think including India, will outbreed <clears throat> the people from Britain, and this will wreak havoc, you know, on prices oh, and yeah, wages, yeah. and it's a big crisis. And he even says we need to worry not only about the quantity of people, but the quality of people in the world. Yes, and, and if you look at him in the 1920s in particular, I mean, he has extremely disparaging things to say about, uh, about working people in general. There's an essay in 1926, I believe, where he is talking about, um, <laughs> he's talking about the proletariat and the coming revolution. And he says, you know, how can, I, how can I prefer a theory that holds up, you know, the working people who are the mud to the fish of, of the middle class? He's, he's very much a middle class uh, Kind of pugilist, he he believes that the the British middle class that he comes from is the you know 
much the way that he thinks that the British Empire is this fount of goodness and light. He thinks the British middle class is, is also superior. But I do think those ideas temper over the course of his, uh, over, over the course of his career. He comes to believe that prosperity is something that can be shared more broadly and that uh, in sharing prosperity more broadly, th th by prosperity, I mean the type of life that he and his friends in Bloomsbury lived around the turn of the century, um, where they're thinking about art and philosophy and you know, doing all the stuff that intellectuals think of as fun. And he comes, I think he comes to think, to believe that that can be shared by a very broad swath of the population, but he does not believe that his, his whole life, certainly. Um, is it fair that, that um, Friedman gets in Hayek at a lot of flack for talking to Pinochet and and uh, Keynes, you know, wrote a German introduction to his book. You know, I I think that's up for for people to to make their minds about. I I, I think all of these thinkers, if you're trying to find a hero who fits, uh, you know, some model for decency and goodness by today's standards, um, and you're looking at intellectuals from from the early mid 20th century, you know, you're going to find things you don't like about them. Um, I, I certainly think, you know, Joan Robinson, who is in a lot of ways, one of, I think, the most important intellectual partners that uh, Keynes works with on the general theory. You know, what, what Joan Robinson goes on to say about North Korea is North Korea is not quite as bad as it is today when she's praising it, but certainly what she says about China and the Cultural Revolution, I mean, I, I don't see how, you know, how, how you can really defend that stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and particularly for a theory that's supposed to be, you know, that it, as, as, I, as I take Keynes, I, I, I take him to be thinking about economics as sort of the field where liberalism can fight authoritarianism. Through economic policy making, we can keep uh, authoritarianism at bay without resorting to war and violence and all of these, these horrors that he's scarred by in, in World War I. And if that's, if that's the purpose of the project, then when you come around and start talking about, you know, the Cultural Revolution is a good idea, you know, I, I think you've, you've lost the plot a bit. So um, there are a lot of these people who are super smart, making great, uh, you know, great innovations in their field who are also doing things that I think are just politically uh, not <laughs> indefensible, by, certainly by modern standards. Are you ready for a bout of underrated versus overrated? <laughs> Tyler, I'm enjoying this. I hope you are. Yes. <laughs> okay. First one, overrated or underrated? Traveling in Taiwan. Underrated. I love Taiwan. I mean, uh, soup dumplings. Um, it's just a, it's a beautiful place. Big mountains, beautiful ocean. Uh, what, what's, what's not to like? And other than Taipei, where should people go next? Well, where did we go? <laughs> went to Taipei and uh, we went to a beach town. I don't remember the beach town. Uh, my, my wife's family is um, from Shanghai and then uh, Taiwan and then the United States. So we went on a trip with them, God, four years ago. Um, and they were, our, they were our tour guides, it was incredible. But yeah, I really only know Taipei. I, I can't give you better advice. The 1965 Immigration Reform Act, overrated or underrated? Wow, wow, you're going right at it. Uh, so my wife, who we, I just mentioned, just wrote a book on the 1965 Immigration uh, Reform Act. Tell us the title, please. <clears throat> it's called uh, One Mighty and Irresistible Tide, The Epic Struggle for American Immigration, 1924 to 1965. I don't, I, I find her book really complicated. Uh, I don't come away from, that law, I think in general it's underrated because people just don't know what it is. I would say underappreciated maybe. Um, it's, it's just not very well known, I think, in, in American society. But you know, there are things about this law that work. There are things about this law that don't work. Some of the things that I think, at least from a progressive standpoint today, we'd say are good about the law are kind of an accident um, that take place largely because the, the architects of the law don't intend them to, to take place, the, the sort of uh, significant increase in Asian American immigration is certainly the architects of the law aren't anticipating that. Um, I, you know, look, my, uh, my wife's family is here because of that law. So it's underrated. It's great. I, I met my wife. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> otherwise that wouldn't have happened. That was important for me. And from a, certainly from a, a narrow selfish standpoint, I'll say it's underrated. The sex pistols overrated or underrated? God, come on, man. Um, it's so hard because they, they're a one trick pony. 
one album, right? <clears throat> the yeah. rest you can forget. And it's really just one note. I mean, all the good songs in there are basically the same song rewritten. Um, but look, they change, they, they change the, the face of music. Um, you wouldn't have the replacement. I've been reading this, um, this Bob Mayer biography of the replacements, which are my, my favorite band. And you just absolutely wouldn't have that band without the Sex Pistols. I do think that people get that they're a big deal, though. You know, I, 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 I think very highly of the Sex Pistols. I think I would say they're overrated. People, you know, they're deeply influential, but still overrated. And that some of these former punk rockers now support Donald Trump. Is that a flip <laughs> or is that actual consistency? Mm, it's tough, you know, with, uh, with Johnny Rotten, John Lydon, you know, he's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, the Sex Pistols are not, you know, anarchy for the UK, right? I mean, that, which kind of anarchy? <laughs> There's uh, anarchy from the right, from the left. I think Bodies is, is certainly conservative from a, you know, abortion rights perspective. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I, the, my next book is gonna be, uh, is, is, a, is a look at populism in the 1890s. And I, I, I do think you have to grapple with the way that these sort of radical, um, radical figures, radical ideas, you know, there's always an interpretation that makes them look good. Um, but I, I do think you have to wrestle with, with the way that, you know, radical change is often flirting with stuff that's, that's really not great and this is this is something I, I mean i really came to appreciate the conservative streak in kane's writing writing this book you know he he is very afraid of social change in in this way that contemporary progressives are not like he he likes edmund burke um and it's not it's not like a a con he's not putting on some sort of so, some sort of act so that he can you know get more conservative you know subscribers to his patreon um, he really is worried about social change and social upheaval, and I don't think, um, I don't think, people who haven't lived through revolutions and war often appreciate how how bad things can go. So with the Sex Pistols, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that the Sex Pistols, like Johnny Rotten loving Donald Trump, is a is a huge change from 1977. Um, but I also. You know, I didn't really follow Public Image Limited and, and a lot of the stuff that he did in the 80s musically. Um, it it's just, not bad, but it's not important, I think. Yeah, like it just <laughs> didn't, it didn't do anything for me. I, I'm not like against it, um, but I, I remember listening to it when I was, you know, 17 or 18, you know, the, the age where you, you get into this stuff and, and it, just, it just didn't grab me. So you know, maybe there's, there's a whole lot of really interesting intellectual stuff happening there that you could tell a story about, but I, I can't because I <laughs> just don't know the material. Samuel Delaney, overrated or underrated? Ah, oh, yes. How do you know? How do you know? You did your research. Um, it's super underrated. Underrated. Why? Why is it important? Yeah. Nova, tell us why. Oh my God, I love that book. I just read it for a book club. Um, Nova is Nova is a book about all these things we just we we're just talking about. It's about radical change. It's about economic competition. It's about uh, the shift in paradigms between. Uh, in a society that is intellectual paradigms and material paradigms in an internationalist society. It's about all the forms of social conflict and possibility that I think exist in a, a globalized world, even though it's about an interstellar society. Um, it's about freedom and art and um, cruelty and truth and it's and it's also just a, a fun a fun space opera i mean it's it's all packed into a, a, a an exciting tale his later stuff where he you know nova is one of these you know 250 page sci-fi you know kind of thriller novels from the 60s his later stuff where he gets into 800 page books about about sexuality i think are really good too but they're not fun the way nova is fun the Bretton Woods monetary system, <clears throat> overrated or underrated? Underrated. You know, I think uh, we only really had it for about nine years. You know, once all of the uh, all of the rules had been implemented and everything. Um, so it's 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 not like it was the this gigantic success for for so long. But I you know I, I kind of agree with Paul Volcker. Like that was that was a mistake to blow up. There there were it was a framework um, for international cooperation and harmony, I think, that was 
that allowed for negotiation and um, I, 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 there was a sort of shared set of norms um, that I think, I think we miss today. I think particularly the, the deterioration of the US relationship with China right now, for instance, difficult thing to imagine if you, the US and China were part of, of, of a Bretton Woods Accord. But didn't it have to blow up? So wasn't the whole thing premised on the notion that the US could just keep on printing dollars which actually the world wanted to have out there, mm -hmm. and that other countries, but most of all the French, would never take those dollars and convert them into gold. And once the French started going to the gold window, which is inevitable, it's a general way that a speculative pay gets broken, yep. it was all over. And there were particular details to how it ended, but speculative pegs, I'm sorry, pegs are hit by right. speculative attacks right. and they fail. Right, and, and you know, it's a story that you can, you see happening in the 1990s and all of the financial crises uh, that that happened there, so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it, there's a weakness. <laughs> I, I don't don't disagree with the critique, but you know, everybody got along until it blew up. Uh, maybe it did have to fail. I mean, Keynes certainly didn't like the idea of of uh, linking everything to the dollar and linking the dollar to gold. Um, but I don't I don't think he necessarily was worried about it predominantly from the sort of speculative peg hot money. Kind of kind of issue. I think he was more just issued about more, more concerned about the replacement of Britain with America as a sort of geopolitical, you know, hegemonic issue. But um, but you know, I don't know. It it seemed to work okay until it didn't. <laughs> was the euro a good idea? Because if you like Bretton Woods, you might think the euro is a more enduring version of it. But it's not obvious to me the euro has gone well. No, the euro has been a disaster. Uh, but it was the euro a good idea. I mean, which part of the euro? The idea of these countries working together and and um, and having a shared kind of sense of cooperation and fair play. That's good. Uh, you know, look, you you can't do the euro without. Uh, you you need to have monetary flexibility within the euro. And, and, and look, that's a, that's a problem within the bread and wood system too. Um, but the euro is clearly just too rigid a system to, to work. And it, I think it has that, it, it is, it has resulted in the opposite of what it was intended to do. Um, but was it a good idea? You know, uh, well, it hasn't worked. Let's say that. <laughs> Credit card and debit card fees. <clears throat> What is the incidence of those fees in today's America, 2020? The incidence of credit card. Who actually pays them in the end final analysis? Not where are they levied up front, but the actual incidence. Uh, I'm. <laughs> but you have an article on this, right? Do I? So some people <laughs> think while. consumers pay them. Oh, 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 wait, swipe fees, swipe fees. Swipe, swipe fees, fees, yes. I was, I was like, there are so many fees. What do you mean? Oh, swipe fees, yeah. You know, I think ultimately consumers probably pay something. I, I think debit card, I mean, my, the significance of that article, this is from 2011, the, the swipe fee fight. Um, you know, I think the significance of that fight is that it that didn't really matter that much at all. Consumers, I do think ultimately pay some of those fees in, in, in the form of, of higher prices, but retailers do their best to minimize that and, and capture those fees for themselves. Um, so who pays, you know, a little bit, a little bit of the consumer, um, a little bit of, uh, of, of the merchant, but it, it, they, they, they share these. It depends on the fee and the merchant, you know. Now, let's say we made it completely impossible for credit card companies to stop merchants from offering cash discounts. And there are indeed right now many cash discounts. Mm. Uh, wouldn't that solve the whole problem? that if it were easier to use cash, those gains would be internalized through a cash discount and buyers would decide credit, debit card or cash and receive different prices and things would be fine. Correct or not? Uh, I, I, it sounds okay to me. I mean, we'll just see what happens. <laughs> but then it's an easy sure. problem, right? It's not a big problem in that worldview. Right, I mean, look, my, I'm mostly an empiricist on these things. You just see what, what happens. Um, do, do prices go up? Do people like, you know, you, you can look into the corporate revenues or not. Um, I, I, my general view about this white fee issue was not about, you know, whether, whether merchants were, were taking it on the chin or consumers were taking it on the chin. It's just that it wasn't that big a deal. And that uh, particularly in 2011, when we were in the middle of a 
terrible depression. Um, the idea that, that we were going to fight over this in the Senate for six months struck me as extremely minor. Um, you know, we were talking about something that mattered largely, not even to retailers in general, but to large retailers that had to pay a lot of these fees. So, you know, Walmart, Target, um, these, these big companies, these fees add up over time. Um, you know, what, what you do about it you know, depends on what works. Try something. Now, as you know, in Keynes' treatise on money, he endorses Knapp's state theory of money. Uh, does the evolution of cryptocurrency show that Knapp, in fact, was wrong, that money is a market phenomenon? Ooh, uh, great question. I don't think so. I, you know, I'm very critical of cryptocurrency in general. I, I don't, um, I'm very skeptical about it, and I think it's often just a sort of vehicle for fraud. Um, ha, do we have cryptocurrency? Is cryptocurrency really a currency? Do people really use it the way they use uh, dollars and euros and, and other currencies? Not, I mean, there, there are transactions that take place, right? Um, There's a lot of gray market, black market transactions, but the point is they could, right? It's a kind of proof by existence. You can have an asset that's fully market-based. You can, uh, but you don't. I mean, it's, um, you know, we definitely have, you definitely have cases of cryptocurrency disappearing, frauds, and, and the like. I mean, um, there is, but yeah, among, um, among cryptocurrency users, there is a sort of common agreement that, uh, that this counts for something. Um, can that be sustained as a social phenomenon outside, uh, you know, the, the, some, some niche users? Uh, I, I mean, particularly, I think it really does matter that this stuff is happening out, that so much of the, the use of the currency as currency is happening outside the political system, right? I mean, a lot of the stuff that's happening there is illegal. Um, so we're talking about non-governmental activity. Um, I, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't know. I, to, to me, the, the, the experience with cryptocurrency points the, the other direction, that, uh, that you need some sort of, uh, you know, political management of this stuff for it to, to have real meaning, that otherwise it's, it's sort of a fleeting and, uh, and not particularly useful medium. Keynes works for, I think, seven years on treatise on money. It's two volumes. At the end, what he comes up with is a tabular standard, which I'm fine with, by the way. But is it even a good book at all? I mean, Hansen, Hayek, they didn't like the model. They, they more or less trash it. Hayek will claim Keynes repudiated his own book. I mean, what's in treatise on money? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think he does repudiate his own book. I mean, how do you get to the general? I mean, there'd be no need for the general theory if the treatise on money was right. Um, you know, I, the treatise of money is a, it's a big mess. Uh, it's like 800 pages, two volumes. Uh, Keynes himself says aesthetically it's a disaster, but he, he feels like he's come to the right answer. You know, by the end of the book, he's got this sort of weird, uh, justification for public works. He's, he's, he's come to the conclusion by the time he's done with it, that, that public work spending and budget deficits are, are necessary for getting out of the depression. And he's just trying to, he's just tying himself in knots to come up with uh, an economic theory that will justify that, um, that policy preference. And I don't think there are many, I mean, th these people may exist, but I don't think there are many people who think the justification for public works in, um, in a treatise on money is is more persuasive than that in, in the general theory. He basically says this is sort of a, a one-time thing that we have to do because of the way trade relationships have worked out at this particular moment in time. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very ad hoc. Uh, the, the thing that's important about the treatise on money is how much fun Keynes has talking about the rise of capitalism in the 16th and 17th century and and Knapp's theory, chartalism, theory of state theory of money. I, I think that is really essential to the ideas that he develops further in the general theory. If you take um, money to be a creature of the state rather than of markets, as, as we're talking about, um, 
then you're just allowed to do a lot. The idea of the market is something that can function independently of the government becomes much blurrier. And the idea of the state as sort of the thing that creates and guides markets, um, I think opens up a broader realm for government intervention. Um, but God, I mean, it's a mess of a book. You know, he does, there's, there's the international system that where he talks about the, the bank core and the international super bank is his sort of, um, that's sort of his blueprint for what he's going to bring to Bretton Woods later, which, you know, he, he loses on all of those important fights. Um, so that's in there, but the whole thing is just a mess. I mean, he, he himself is changing his mind so many times over the course of this book uh, in response to political circumstances. I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think, Look, even even the general theory is a bit of a mess too. So it's it's not like you know he has one definitive statement that that is Keynesianism. I, I sort of reject that the school of thought that it, it's all in the general theory. Um, but I, I I think of it as sort of a a, a step along the road. It, it shows that he's he's willing to change his mind, but he hasn't really he hasn't figured it out yet. For me, Keynes is one of the greatest biographical writers in the entire English language ever. What do you think? <clears throat> is his best biographical portrait in Essays and Biography, which is one of my favorite books, I might add. That's good, isn't it? I think my favorite is just Newton, um, because it's not, he packs so many ideas into, into the way he writes about, about Newton. And he does, there's a couple of different essays on, on him. Um, but the, the point about Newton as a, and, and look, I don't know enough about Newton to know if his biography is accurate, <laughs> to be clear. Uh, you know, I, I know, uh, you know the, the, the big, big points on Newton's life, but I haven't read several biographies. But the, the way that he talks about Newton as, uh, as someone who was sort of a creative genius, uh, the scientist as, as, as an artist who has a certain intuition about the way the world works, um, who then, you know, uses the math to, to explain um, why his, his aesthetically kind of beautiful intuition about, about you know, God's plan or the, the nature of reality, um, why that makes sense. You know, I think Keynes is, is maybe that's true about Newton. I, I don't know. I just don't know the guy psychologically enough. But I, I think that tells us something interesting about Keynes's own psyche. Um, I think that a lot of Keynes's economic work functions in that way. Um, and I also think it's useful to think about the scientist as somebody who is not just a, a bloodless technician, right? That, that scientific work is creative work. Um, and the great scientists are people who are doing something that is aesthetically significant in addition to being technically significant, that they have an idea um, that they're possessed with. I, you know, I, we're used to thinking of scientists as people in lab coats who just, you know, never smile. And <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not the way people are. Did Keynes have good taste in art? His friends didn't think so. Um, what is good taste in art? I think he had excellent taste. Yeah. He bought those Cezanne <laughs> apple sketches. Four people understood how wonderful they are. Uh, some Degas ballerinas. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't pay that much for them. <clears throat> Cezanne and Degas yeah. were not undiscovered artists at that time. No. <clears throat> but still. He, he did get them in a fire sale. I mean, uh, so, you know, they're, they're literally, they're, he went to Paris and the, the Germans were getting close. They were under bombardment. That's why they were liquidating it. Um, you know, it, I, I like Cezanne and Degas as much as the next guy. I, I think his friends, his friends were so fussy. You know, they, they, they were envious of his sort of social position. They were, and they, they couldn't do the economic work that he did. It just was over their heads. Um, and, and so, you know, they, art was their thing. So they were always telling him he had bad taste. Um, but, you know, those apples, those apples were pretty good in the Cezanne, right? <laughs> the, um, what, what's the, the museum in Philadelphia that there was uh, such a, such a Barn. fight though? <clears throat> Barnes. Yes. yes, the Barnes Museum. So I never saw the Barnes Museum when it was, you know, b before its transformation. Um, there's so many, you can just see there's so many different, th these, these artists, not every single one of their works was amazing. Sometimes they, they had bad, there are bad Renoirs, there are bad Cezannes. So, you know, I haven't seen every single one of the Cezannes that, uh, that Cades talked up. I mean, in, in the archives at, um, 
at King's College, there's a lot of art, uh, but it's most that's that's on display. But it's mostly stuff from other Bloomsbury people. Um, so, and and there, I think you know, I think the Bloomsburys themselves were probably overrated as as painters, at least. Um, but whatever, these 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 tastes <coughs> shift. I think Keynes was probably okay. I don't think he was as bad as his friends said. Let me ask you the question Ezra asked you. In the time of Keynes, especially the earlier years, why would anyone have defended the gold standard? I think almost everyone did who thought about it. Um, and I think it was tied up in a conception of liberalism and freedom that is very intuitively compelling to people who take enlightenment liberalism seriously. Um, if you believe that people ought to, that, that, that capricious sovereigns and governments shouldn't meddle in the affairs of the, the people and, and you know, direct the, the flows of international commerce for their own short-term gains and, and political uh, preferences, then the gold standard is a way to, to put, some, put some brakes on the government and to, and to say not only that we will um, you know, not meddle in, in the currency for domestic purposes, but we won't, we won't interfere with international harmony and with the exchange of goods and ideas across different cultures. Um, I think there is, it's very easy to, to see why people from a progressive um, perspective would see that as a, uh, as a good thing. Um, why weren't they just correct? So Christina Romer has shown GDP volatility was not higher before the Fed. And if countries had stayed on the gold standard, they couldn't have fought World War I. That sounds pretty good to me. Well, if, she, if she's right, then, um, then she's right. I, I think um, ultimately politics exist. And um, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to create a, a system that says, when your back gets up against the wall, uh, you've just got to deal with it because people will break the rules. Um, the, the Keynesian argument against it, by the time he gets to a treatise on money, at least, is is that you have to do something about the social, the short-term social pressures that are caused um, that when when you are up against deflation, essentially, that unemployment, um, social unrest, that is that is something governments will have to respond to, and if they don't, what you get will be worse um, than whatever you would. It will prevent the long run from coming to be. This is, you know, this is one of the sort of philosophical dimensions of the in the long run we are all dead um, claim. He's he's not just saying, you know, we can make things better in the short term and that's important. Um, he's saying if you don't fix things in the short term, the long term may never actually happen. You you, you have an authoritarian takeover or a war or something. Um, so I think particularly once you see, at least for Keynes, once he sees what the state of deprivation that's happening across Europe after the war. He just thinks that this is an untenable system. Before the war, you know, I, if the gold standard had been managed wisely, I mean, we never would have needed Keynesian economics, right? I mean, it, it would have, <laughs> nobody would, there would have been no need for, for Keynes to come up with a complicated economic explanation for uh, deficit spending or to, to try to focus on uncertainty as this key concept. It just, you know, things just would have, would have worked out. In a famous essay, as you know, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, I think it's 1930, Keynes predicted we, I'm not sure who the we is here, would be working 15 hours a week. What did he get wrong? Or was he just off by a few decades? Well, I think, you know, th there's the, um, Benjamin Friedman, I think, did, uh, did the analysis most recently. Um, Bob Solo did one, uh, 2007, 2008. Um, if you take living standard to be, you know, something like GDP per capita, then the actual productive output of society is pretty close to what, to what Keynes is talking about in economic possibilities for our grandchildren. But the distribution of that, um, of that output is, is, is not egalitarian. So, you know, the, the answer that I put in my book that I think is basically right is that most of these gains are captured by people at the top. And so as a result, we have people working all the time. Um, but median family income in the US was, is now still past the range where Keynes would have predicted 15 hours of work a week, right? 
So it's an uneven yeah. distribution, but median mm. wage in Keynes' time was pitifully low. And sure. now it's still pretty high. I mean, you know, you can see the, um, the, the decline in working hours is, is pretty steady over the late 19th and um, into the you know, 1940s. So I think he, he writes that essay in 1928, it's published in 1930, maybe it's 1926 when he actually writes it, but, but it's published in 1930. You know, even in the depression, you can see this decline in, in working hours. It's, it's, it, is, uh, it is very pronounced and then it just kind of stops in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and you know, I, that, that to me is, do, do we want to be working this, this long? I mean, most of us, at least I, I don't want to be working 40 hours a week. Uh, you work more much than more than 40. Yes, uh, yeah, but I would, uh, you know. You wrote a book that just made a top 10 list, right? That's not easy. What yeah, your wife I, does, her, her book is very highly regarded. She's an editor for the New York Times. Yes. It's an incredible we, amount of work. So you and she are going way past 40. Yeah. So what's uh, the deal? Yeah, well, you know, I think um, the books, the books are an interesting question. Like, do, does, that, does that count as work? Um, you know, when I write about politics and economic policy and specific issues uh, that people are fighting about in Washington, that, that feels like work. It's stressful. It is, uh, I have to learn things um, that I don't necessarily enjoy learning. Um, so doing the book, the research, the history, that was fun. Um, that was that was exciting. That was uh, that was joyful in a certain way. Now, once we had our daughter, uh, almost fifteen months ago. Um, Congratulations! Thank you. Uh, you know, my to be perfectly frank, my interest in, in historical research has waned a bit, um, and and so I don't know if I would think of if I think of historical work and, and work on the next book is the same sort of just pure expression of like what I would do with my free time that I did um, this book. I would probably rather be, you know, hiking in the woods with my daughter, or, um, you know, reading through books about bears, or what, you know, whatever she's into. It that the, my my priorities have changed. Um, but yeah, no, like there's there's an argument that um, I think Joe Stiglitz makes this in part, and there's a, the whole book on on economic consequences or economic, economic possibilities for our grandchildren that came out about 2008 with all these different essays from people, at, you know, investigating. Um, what Keynes got right and what he got wrong. And one of the answers is that, you know, people actually like working and that there's a certain class of people who do work that's not really work. And I certainly consider myself to be in that class of people. And it's true that I like that work. Um, but even, even the type of work that I do, I have, <laughs> you know, once, uh, once my daughter arrived, I, just, I would just like to do less. Uh, and I, and I think a lot of people with families, that's, that's, that's the case. You, you know, you, um, you would you wouldn't work as much as you do if you could if you could work less and feel a sense of security about the future um and that sense of security about the future is a is a tricky thing because what constitutes security you get accustomed to a certain you know standard of living you want that for your children uh, so that i admit that there's there's a gray area there but uh, or it's not even gray it's just kind of fuzzy um but but yeah, I, I think a lot of people choose to work more than they they probably should uh and I'm sure that as my daughter gets older you know whether I want to be writing, you know, more books or coaching basketball will be, uh, you know, <laughs> a major decision. Last question. What is your next overwork project? Overwork project. Uh, the current working title is called Fields of Fire. Um, it's a look at the populists of the 1880s and 1890s. And right now, it looks like we're going to tell it through the lives of Two, two white populists and two black populists from Georgia and North Carolina. And, but we'll see, you, you, you kind of got to go where the research takes you with this stuff. But in a lot of ways, I think what the populists are, are working through in the 1880s and 1890s is very similar to what Keynes is working through. Um, their economic proposals are a bit different, but they see themselves as um, inhabiting an era of crisis in which the economic system is not working. And it's the same economic system, really. It's the, it's, they're, they're writing about the gold standard at its, at its outset. Keynes is, is writing about it at its maturity. Uh, and they're trying to come up with ways to reformulate politics to make the economic system work. Um, and I think there's, as with Keynes, an enormous amount of promise and also an enormous amount of um, danger in, in what they're doing. And I think in the, way, the same way that you talked about Keynes being um, enamored with the 
the British colonial system, uh, or at least overly enamored with it. Um, I think the pop, there's, there's a lot of intellectual stuff happening with the populace this period of time, which is inspiring, but also, also dangerous. Um, and uh, I just find it a fascinating era. So hopefully the books, <laughs> it's not a biography, but it, 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 will, it will try to try to work with a lot of the same currents and themes that were in McCain's book. Zach Carter, thank you very much. Thanks, Tyler.